rapid technology innovations have brought about a, new, a need for novel training and new skill sets for lawyers. Here to talk more about this new normal is the uh, former dean of Northwestern Pritzker School of Law and Professor Dan Rodriguez. Thank you. I can't use the phrase uh, non-lawyer, so I'm the non-female member of this panel. I'm the non-non-Hispanic member of this panel, and uh, uh, no more non-anon. I'm, I'm here to bring good news. No, I'm not, I'm not the religious uh, missionary. I'm here to bring good news about new law and new lawyering and provide a little bit of perspective about what I see, uh, I won't say from the trenches. I have the luxury of being able to navel gaze given that that's my day job in the ivory tower. Guilty as charged. But nonetheless, having the wonderful experience of having been the dean at Northwestern for some years, I, it brought me into contact and connection with lawyers. And every single day I'm in contact and connection with, uh, with law students to have a sense of, of how they're thinking about changes in the profession. So having brought that good news, let me mix that metaphor and burst the bubble a little bit and say the, the expectations and the description of new law and new lawyering is as much an aspiration as a description of the, uh, of the real world. So, so different folks in the audience and two different narratives, many, maybe many narratives. Uh, this won't appeal to those of you who are the proverbial Pollyanna who want to say that, that basically everything uh, uh, is great now, just as it's ever been. I doubt there's anybody in the audience that has that way, but there still is a narrative that says new law lawyering, what's wrong with the old lawyering? There are different kinds of skeptics. There are skeptics, on the one hand, about the way in which we're in the business of lawyering, and they're the ones who are really very quick to get on the train, to do anything that's new. But there's the skeptic that also says, I'm skeptical of change. What's so new about this new lawyering, and what are we, what are we trying to juxtapose with the same way that it, that it used to be? We're coming close to an election year, so of course we have to say something about the choice. And the choice here uh, uh, involves, in some sense, in a rough outline, something that involves what are your assumptions? The beauty of what we can think about as lawyers are, are we're building our practices on, on the foundation of assumptions about the state of the world, about the economy, about our political system, about many, many other facts, about human behavior, we're all in that business together, those of us who are in law. And testing those assumptions, I, as I always, and my colleagues always say to our students, interrogate your assumptions about the states of the world, that will help you understand what are your priors, what are, are your disruptors, and what you think uh, will actually happen in the real world. Do you have skin in the game? And I want to be careful about saying this. A lot of the, 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 the calls for change and the calls for the revolution, uh, revolutionizing of the law because of technology come from messengers that come from technology vendors, from folks who have specific skin, skins in the game. It's, none of us can be truly object, objective, nor should aspire to be. But we should be thinking about what are the presuppositions that come from where we are in, to use Lucy's wonderful phrase, the legal, legal, legal ecosystem. What is the evidence? We've heard a lot today about, uh, about evidence-based decision-making, about what we can measure and how we can test our assumptions and test particular changes. The efficacy and the value of what I call new law, or whatever it else you, uh, you call it, will stand or fall on our ability to measure significant changes in the legal system and to use and utilize evidence to tell us what reforms and what suggestions work and what don't work so well. And what are the levers? What are the, what are the uh, underlying, not only suppositions, but the things that might, uh, might affect and, and drive change? I'm an optimist, but with an apocalyptic streak. That is, I, I think that new law, new lawyering is going to make, uh, make significant advances. But at the same time, I worry greatly about the capacity of the legal system and the rule of law to withstand the stressors, the stressors that, uh, that, uh, that keep us up at night. Uh, I should say uh, uh, food for thought rather than an outline. What are our true colors? How do we think about the character of law and the characteristics of lawyers and those who provide legal services? Again, what are the assumptions underneath our, our suppositions about the state of the world? What are the disruptors? Uh, from this chaos, to give you a, a little bit of a spoiler alert about where I'm going, what new emerges? Not only in, with respect to new law, but new uh, impacts on society. And what sustains real innovation? That, I hope, is a rhetorical question that you take with you from today and all of these presentations, is what uh, innovation is all fine and good, but what sustains it? Let's begin uh, not by valorizing lawyers, but by understanding our value added and revel in it. We are the ones responsible for the wise restraints that keep individuals free. 
We all know that the reference point that appears on a million coffee mugs and t-shirts about first let's kill all lawyers in the context of Shakespeare's play was let's kill all lawyers because those lawyers are the protectors of the rule of law and the first thing we can do to undermine the rule of law and move toward a monarchy is to rid ourselves of lawyers and those who protect the legal system. Having uh, embraced this notion and this model of lawyers as the wonderful protectors of the rule of law, let's be clear what the characteristics of law and lawyers are, though, that raise significant challenges to the ability of us to pursue innovation and sustain innovation. This is the abominable no man or woman. And uh, these are the, the, this is part sort of deeply embedded in the kind of anti-entrepreneurial spirit, or at least let's say the reputation for anti-entrepreneurial spirit that lawyers have. You can't do that. Here's a significant risk. Don't do that. So the thought of I'm not, it's not only I'm not a numbers person, that's why I'm a lawyer. I'm not an entrepreneur. I have a characteristic of being very risk averse. Is part and parcel of the reputation that lawyers have that obviously retards innovation in a significant way. So what are the assumptions? Let's dig a little bit deeper. The assumptions about the characteristics of law and the characteristics of, uh, of lawyering. One is that law is intrinsically backward looking. That's not a radical supposition. That is some part and parcel of what it means to be involved in law, to study it, to write it, to read it, and to practice it. We're dealing with statutes enacted in the past. The common law method is expected to be, as Blackstone and others taught us, uh, incremental, slow moving. Law moves slowly and legal change moves slowly. And you know what? By and large, that's a good thing. The, the, uh, uh, but, but it's a mixed blessing. We celebrate the fact that the United States Constitution is the oldest constitution in the history of the world. But that too is a problem. So it's a mixed blessing. And the fact that law is so impervious to change and that lawyers are so, uh, so impervious to change is a characteristic of law, but it's not an immutable characteristic. It's something that actually can be subject to interrogation, there's the assumption point again, and also subject to significant change. Lawyers are cautious by temperament, I exaggerate to make a point, and our cautious types uh, tend to self-select to these careers. Hence the notion that I decided not to be an entrepreneur, so I decided to go to a law school. They're cautious in advice, but paradoxically aggressive in advocacy. Scorched earth, zealously represent clients to the limits of the law. Legal disputes are viewed as zero-sum games. Litigation is about shrinking the pie. There are winners and there are losers, so the assumption goes. Bet the company litigation is the default. Why spend uh, 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 $10 or $100 might, uh, might, might be worth, worthily and justifiably invested in, uh, in, in, uh, in disputes, in the resolution of disputes? All of that, to the extent that that captures in your mind something, some reality, is subject and has been subject to significant disruptors, many of which have been talked about over the course of today, and much, much of which gets a lot of attention, a lot of ink, maybe too much ink, in the popular press and the legal press. Those disruptors include, you're hanging at the edge of your seat, I can tell. <laughs> Sorry, keep pushing the wrong button. That's technology, I tell you. Uh, 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 computing power, extensive, expansive uh, power of computing. The availability of big data and the use of big data. And the, and the, and the complex and still unproven role of machine learning, predictive analytics artificial intelligence, which to say is a mixed bag is to make an obvious point. It's a mixed bag both at the level of prediction, how will it destabilize law or will it, but it's also a mixed bag at a normative level. On the one hand, we can celebrate and embrace the use of, use of machine learning and artificial intelligence to generate efficiencies and, and, and deal with access to justice, but on the other, we know enough to know much about algorithmic bias, Garbage in, garbage out. The reliance on, on chatbots and the, and, the, and the absence of a regulatory regime that really deals with issues of machine learning. Suffice to say that machine learning along with uh, variations on that same theme are very significant disruptors uh, uh, to the law and you don't have to take my word for it. Richard Susskind uh, uh, famously uh, uh, presented in, the, in, in the, perhaps the ill-tempered titled book, The End of Lawyers, a number of years ago a change in the evolution of legal services. Uh, having learned that lesson, his latest book, Tomorrow's Lawyers, tells a different sort of story, <laughs> right? 
which is not about the dissolution of legal practice, but the adaptation of legal practice. And also, a key message being the different kinds of jobs and the different kinds of opportunities for those who graduate with law degrees and those who didn't gra don't graduate with law degrees. See, I avoided the phrase. Uh, global forces. You like that slide? It's a picture of the Earth. Uh, uh, but global forces, forces have mean so many different things. Uh, increasing, uh, decreasing reliance on borders and interjurisdictional uh, competition for, for legal services. I mean, not only across the world, but also across our states. The destabilization of existing regimes of regulation that limit significantly the ability of individual American lawyers to practice law outside the jurisdiction, and vice versa. The uh, destabilization of individual national economies, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> Global forces that are significant disruptors to the structure of our, legal, of our legal system. And no conference, indeed no talk at a conference, should, should miss or omit the significant access to justice crisis. Underserved legal representation for the poorest of the poor and those other vulnerable in society, even the middle class, a significantly underrepresentation. What I always like to emphasize, which is, it's not just uh, an on-off switch, that is individuals who can't find access to lawyers, it's individuals who, even once they find access to lawyers, basically have an une are on an uneven, unequal playing field vis-a-vis -vis other folks uh, in, in, uh, in matters of dispute. Federal appropriations have, you know the story. All of that is to suggest that the access to justice crisis, maybe calling it a disruptor doesn't capture the, the term exactly right, but is a sustained and important problem that new law, new lawyering has to, has to, has to address. Obstacles and impediments to change. All surmountable, but important nonetheless. I talked already about legal culture, the reputation of lawyers of being risk averse uh, uh, and the like. Risk aversion, same general point. Regulation, which I want to sp uh, spend a couple minutes on. It's been raised, of course, throughout the course of the day. And I, I simply uh, 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 raise this issue not at my peril, but in order to illustrate a broad point. We are not served well by the existing regulatory regime. That's not a point that there's a structure of protectionism that, prote that, that withstands change. That's, that's a point, to be sure. But the basic structure of regulation is not modern, which is to say it's anachronistic. It often is generated by protectionist impulses. As Carolyn Elephant uh, 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 shrewdly noted, it doesn't just impact big, uh, uh, large law firms. It doesn't just impact uh, 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 companies and corporations, but it impacts small firms and solos. It is a problem. It's a problem in Illinois. It's a problem in the United States. It's multifaceted. There's no magic bullet solution to it, but it represents a significant obstacle to, uh, to change. I want to I wanna spend the, the, the rest of my time imagining three futures and basically uh, yoking to that, uh, that to both the normative aspirations for what I call new law, but also the positive description of new law. So we could have one of three futures. Some of you may have seen this ad campaign that's circulating, I think it's AT&T, that talks about good enough. There's an ad about, oh, a good enough doctor, a good enough uh, 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 mechanic, all of that. So this future is basically, things are basically okay and good enough. Here are a variety of scenarios, positive scenarios or descriptive scenarios, of basically business as usual being good enough. The economic recovery that we're experiencing arrests the decline and the decline in legal services and there's an upturn in the legal market, legal education included, last couple of years, uh, uh, an uptick in, in, in applicants to law schools. I always warn my fellow deans, be careful what you wish for, but nonetheless, there seems to be a slight, uh, slight uptick. New use of technology to enhance efficiency. We should, we should reward and embrace folks and law firms, big, small, and otherwise, for utilizing technology more efficiently. A greater alignment and expectations between lawyers and clients. Another way to put it is lawyers say, yep, we got the message and we got the message and we're making our adjustments accordingly. That future, the good enough future, also suggests that firms truly are adapting to new work arrangements, dealing with issues of work-life balance, meaningfully addressing issues of, of diversity as, as was raised before. Law schools are putting more emphasis, maybe not enough, but more emphasis on practical training in order to, 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 uh, to uh, assure their students have adequate proficiencies to, to compete. Uh, regulations, there's some modest change, and we should acknowledge that, both at the state and the national level. There's continued profitability, mostly at the top of the food chain to be sure, but nonetheless, the, the, the richest firms are growing ever richer. Lawyers and judges maintain the guardrails that protect the rule of law, even in a period of time, not to get all political on you, 
even in a period of time in which the rule of law is under some stress. There's a different future and a more worrisome future, one that has much grimmer outcomes. It's one that, that, uh, that, uh, in which we experience grave economic distress, not unlike we experienced a number of years ago, either generally or in segmented markets. And I'm not just talking here about legal markets, but in markets generally. Legal spend continues to decline. Law students will vote with their feet, and what becomes an, a slight uptick becomes a real trough in the face of expensive legal education and legal education that doesn't yet necessarily provide adequate value. And lawyers are in distress in a variety of ways. To continue the grim future, regulatory intransigence, uh, intransigence continues to stifle real innovation and keeps, uh, keeps change at bay. Technology becomes a, a, a weapon that actually turns against us, and it turns out we make bad, bad bets. This conference last year probably had a lot of uh, B word in it, blockchain. What happened to blockchain? <laughs> Folks make technology bets that can be bad bets, and then what happens? Uh, widening access uh, to justice crisis and rule of law in tatters. All right, you got to go away from this conference uh, 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 with, uh, with some good mojo, not uh, some bad mojo. So let me conclude uh, uh, with, a, with a different kind of future, a future that's not simply good enough and it's not grim. It's new law and its prospects. A couple words on the character of law. Character of the law becomes enabling with reformist ambitions. New lawyering is progressive, it's collaborative, it's multidisciplinary, and it's not solely or even mostly backward looking. It's evidence-based. It's based on what you can measure and how you apply those measurements to outcomes. It is democratic. It's not the, the, the ghost in the machine, but it's individuals co uh, collaborating collectively in a democratic way to make and foment and sustain real change. On the character of lawyers, Lawyers become ever more collaborative, both with one another and with folks outside the scheme of just those who are licensed to practice law. They become ever more ethical, and there's a widening and deepening sense of what that actually means. There are widened responsibilities that are system-based, which I mean it's fidelity to access to justice and the system, not just the well-being of lawyers. And they are accountable, the, the, the yin and the yang again that goes along with democracy. We have responsibilities to one another to support and mutual support across the food chain and across the waterfront of those who are involved in the practice of law. We're invested actively and from the time that students come out of law school with significant mentoring. We are de-siloed and we really do as this mantra again comes again, work with folks outside of the formal four corners of the practice of law to become ever more collaborative and we're guild free or at least not as, as intransigent with respect to the changes in guilt. Law schools are also part of this, to finally come to my wheelhouse, right? We have a much more, and we aspire to a much more modern curriculum, a truly modern curriculum that deals with new law and lawyering in the next decade rather than decades in the past. We develop, I hate the phrase practice readiness because I don't know what the heck that means. Instead, we aspire to, to uh, inculcate in our students practice proficiencies so they can have those skills that enable them to prosper as soon as they get out of law school. The research that we do in our law school supports professional education and vice versa. We attend to student health and well-being, which is very, very important, a critical element of, of, of what we ought to be doing as responsible faculty members and deans. And we think about, my phrase, law schools for life, as basically a project not only of focusing on these precious three years, but think about how to sustain education and continue education throughout the course of their, of their careers. So I'll just conclude by saying, why is this the brighter uh, future? I think that's duh. The, question, the more interesting question is, what leads us to that road? And last slide. Changes, significant changes in regulation and regulatory reform. Significant attention to economic factors, including economic factors that are outside of our control. Resolve and imagination to be sure, and sustaining in in uh, innovations. Why the heck not Illinois? Big state, big impact. It should start here. Professionalism endeavors uh, represented by this wonderful commission. The leading law schools that exist in our state and this guy, this guy. If not Illinois, then which state should lead change? Thank you. Thank you.